Now, the purpose of the indicator is very interesting because, and, I, and I'm the one that really sort of promoted the whole concept of indicator fishing uh, through that uh, video that we did on nymphing. And the whole concept there is that the indicator, yeah, it can indicate that the fish is taking the fly, but the whole, indi the whole idea is it tells you the speed that the fly is going because if the indicator is going the same speed as the foam on top, then the fly is going the same speed as the foam on top, which means the fly is not on the bottom. It's up near the top. That was Gary Borger talking about how to fish an indicator correctly, a technique he helped to uh, develop over 40 years ago. This is episode 45 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. In today's episode, I interview Gary Borger, the man who put nymph fishing on the map and had an impact on fly fishing in so many ways. We talk about how he developed the first instructional fly fishing videos, how he helped to uh, develop the current FFF fly casting certification, and where catch and release first started. Gary takes us back to the beginning of nymph fishing in England and then throughout the history of how it came to be in the U.S. Hint, it wasn't always looked upon uh, in a positive light. Don't miss this as Gary breaks down his nymph fishing technique and how you can apply this next time you are on the river. Before I get into the episode today, I wanted to quickly thank our sponsors. Ascent Fly Fishing has customized fly box selections that they put together for your unique stream. These aren't just flies in a box, but they analyze the insect community, do a summary, and provide you with the exact patterns that are in your stream when you're ready to fish. Just go to ascentflyfishing.com and use the coupon code WETFLYSWING to grab 10% off your next order. We are also brought to you by the original tie right, which holds flies and hooks securely so you can tie your fly on with little effort. The uh, tie right senior holds hook sizes 2 through 14 and the junior holds hook sizes 14 through 24. Tie right can help you tie clinch, knot, uh, clinch knots and modified clinch knots and many other knots to suit your needs. Head over to tyright.com and get started today. That's ty-rite.com. So, without further ado, here's Gary Borger from garyborger.com. How's it going, Gary? Great. Great. Great to uh, great to have you on here. We uh, have a number of questions here I want to dig into uh, on the fly fishing end, and I promise not to ask uh, any river runs through it questions. If that's... <laughs> No, I, I do have, I do, I might have one if we have time, because I think, uh, you, you know, that, that was a pretty, uh, interesting, uh, part of, you know, some of the stuff you've done, but, uh, yeah, maybe you can just start us off talking about how you got into fly fishing at, at the start and then how you got into where you are as kind of leading, you know, the fly fishing, um, industry and, and the stuff you've done over the years. I started fly fishing when I was 11 and I actually have been fishing since I was about five. I can I have pictures of me and my brother fishing in the mud puddles in front of my parents' home at the age of four, but I don't remember catching much. But uh, <laughs> as time went on, I started fly. I started fishing for trout in the local streams where we lived in Pennsylvania. And when I was about oh, maybe nine or ten, I started reading my father's outdoor magazines, and there were all kinds of articles in there about fly fishing because at that time, all of the national outdoor magazines had fly fishing writers. So there was Al McLean, there was Ted Trueblood, there was Joe Brooks, the young Ernie Schwiebert, uh, and, and a number of others that all wrote consistently and there were actually fly fishing editors for those magazines. And so I became very interested in the concept of fly fishing. It seemed a very interesting way to catch fish. And so I asked for a fly tying kit for my 11th Christmas. I got that, started tying flies and started fly fishing. And as they say, the rest is history. Mm hmm well, yeah. After, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, you with the fly tying kit. What, what, uh, you know, I know that's something I do. Try to, I try to get people in, you know, new tires and things like that. What, what did that? Do you remember what that felt like when you got your first um, fly tying kit? Well, I was very excited because it was it was exactly the thing I wanted, and it was actually, I think it was put out by Noel N O L L. But the book that was in it was called Family Circle's Guide to Trout Flies and How to Tie Them. And later, Noel 
uh, got the copyright for that, and then he published that and put out his own fly tying kit. But I think the one I got was family was the uh, family circles fly tying kit. Okay. Anyway, there was a lot of junk in there, not very much that was useful, uh, especially for tying the flies that were shown in the book that came with it. <laughs> but you know, I mean, I wish I'd saved a few of those first flies because they were the most horrible looking things you could ever imagine. But in those days, hooks were very expensive, especially for somebody who didn't have any money. And so I would tie flies, cut them apart, tie another one, cut it apart, tie another one. So that's the way I learned to tie was yep. totally by myself. I had no one to teach me how to do it. And I just would look at the book and look at what the what the pictures looked like and try to make my flies look like those those pictures, including the very beautifully tapered heads, not realizing that those were all paintings. They weren't actually photographs. Oh, wow. Do you remember what the uh, first fly that you tied that kind of looked halfway decent was or maybe caught a fish on? Well, the, yeah, the first one that I actually caught a fish on was a coachman. Oh, there you a lead, go. Yeah, a lead, wing, a lead wing coachman, not the white wing coachman, but the lead wing. And I can even, I can remember the first fish as clear as if it was, you know, yesterday. I was fishing. It was it was before my 12th birthday because my birthday is late in May, and the fishing season in Pennsylvania started in April, mid-April. And so I was fishing, and I saw a fish rise on the other side, and, then, and it was, a, I'm sure, a stalked rainbow, probably about 10 inches long. And I sort of slopped that lead wing coachman over there and he took it immediately. And, uh, you know, I can remember, I can still close my eyes and see the whole thing going on. It was so exciting for me. <laughs> anyway, very, very firmly confirmed my, my addiction to fly fishing. Nice. And, and that was on the, like kind of a wet fly. So you're fishing kind of the, the swing or how were you, how did you take that? I fish? Just, well, I just cast it across stream and he took it almost a second hit the water. Oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. So. I didn't have to do anything except throw it over there. Nice, nice. I, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about maybe some different, you know, types and, uh, you know, techniques to use. But um, nymph fishing is one big thing that you um, have written books about and done lots of videos. I was, I was wondering if you could maybe take us back just kind of briefly and do a brief history on, on nymph fishing, like how that all came to be. And I'm not even sure if you know that whole, how it all came down. But I know, you know, wet flies and things like that have had Davey Watton on the show to talk about some traditional type of stuff. But, but, um, is that something you can kind of do for us a little bit? Sure. Nymph fishing has always been a part of fly fishing since probably GEM skews in England, who's considered to be the father of nymph fishing. And he had a couple of techniques that he used on the spring creeks there in, in Southern England on the test and the itching and several of the others, the dove and a few of the other ones there that he fished a lot. And, um, his two techniques were one, which we, which he called the greased leader tactic in which he would literally grease the leader big. Now remember in those days, the leader was made of cat gut, which is actually silk. And, um, the lines were, were made of, um, braided silk. And the fly rods of course were all cane rods. And so in those days, you had to be a little bit careful because the leaders were very delicate. Anyway, so what he would do is he would grease the fly line and he would grease the leader. And, and I'm not sure what they used for grease. It might have been grease, but something to try to keep it <laughs> floating because, because cat gut doesn't float and silk doesn't float. So anyway, he would, he would grease it up and he would cast where he saw a rising fish and he would watch the leader. And if it pulled under, then he would just set the hook. So <laughs> that was called the greased leader tactic. And then there was another one, which he called the wink underwater, in which he would cast and he would watch very closely. Because remember, he's fishing the spring creeks in southern England, which are just absolutely gin clear. Hmm. So if he saw any movement at all, the wink as the fish opened and closed its mouth, or the wink as it turned its body and left a little flash, he would again immediately set the hook. And he and Halford, Frederick Halford, who was the, the dry fly god of that time, used to write back and forth in the um, angling times of, of London uh, about nymph fishing or dry fly fishing. Halford was convinced that trout only wanted dry flies. And of course, Skews knew they would take anything, including nymphs. And he caught tons of fish on nymphs. So he would, he would cast back, you know, they would cast uh, these letters back and forth to one another. And uh, some of them were, were fairly nasty letters <laughs> anyway. So anyway, a lot of people, got the idea that yes, you could catch fish on nymphs. And so nymph fishing was sort of introduced into fly fishing, but 
The dry fly still held today and probably still does today just because you can see the visual take of it. Mm-hmm. And that, that's very exciting for a lot of people. But for me personally, nymph fishing began oh very early on because I'd read about nymph fishing in some of the outdoor magazines. And I began using split shot very early on too, even though it was not de rigueur for the fly fisher to be able to do that. I did it anyway because before fly fishing, I fished with a long spinning rod and six pound test line. And I could put one split shot on a small hook, hook on a red wiggler and cast it out there in the, in the riffles and catch trout all day long. Mm. But when I started fly fishing, I had that big fat fly line that didn't sink at all. And I didn't know very much about leader design because there wasn't much written about it. And as a consequence, I had a very hard time getting my flies down where the fish were. So I just started using split shot like I did with my spinning rod. And it worked just fine. I caught lots of fish on it. Hmm. And I still do that. It's still a very, very effective technique. And you said that, um, so nymph fishing early on was kind of uh, using split shot was a little bit frowned upon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can uh, take us back to that that time and what, what that was kind of like. And, well, when, think- and when was that? What year? Well, that would have been, well, 1956, 57, and, and, and on up into the early 60s. Uh, well, I still, I mean, I still use split shot. But back in those days, fly fishing had matured from, well, I shouldn't say matured, had evolved from actually catching fish basically into dry fly fishing. Uh, fly fishing was considered dry fly fishing. Hmm. Actually, the term fly fishing came from using dry flies because the term fly in England meant the adult insect. Hmm. So when they were fly fishing, they were actually fishing imitations of the adult insect. So, so it was a focus on dries, but there, like you said, back in that time, there were still guys that were doing some nymphing and stuff. Oh yeah. And, and, yeah. and in the, <clears throat> in the late 1800s, we had the evolution of streamer flies and, and bucktails here in the United States. And so there were people that were fishing all sorts of things back in those days, but still, Fly fishing focused more on trout, and it focused more on dry flies than anything else. But very early on, uh, because of the writings of people like uh, Joe Brooks and, and Ernie Schwiebert and Al McLean, who discussed all sorts of fishing, including nymph fishing, I became sort of enamored with that whole concept of being able to catch lots of fish fishing. And, fi- and fishing deep was the way to do it. If you fished a nymph under the surface, you just basically didn't catch anything. You had to get them right down on the bottom. And I can remember tying flies using uh, liquid steel, which was basically just an epoxy material filled with steel filings, <laughs> you know, to make flat, heavily weighted bodies on my nymphs and that sort of thing. And they were very effective and still probably would be, except that I don't I don't use weighted nymphs anymore simply because they get caught up too much. Mm. I just use split shot to keep my flies down deep. Mm-hmm. And then and then uh, to that kind of that period when people were, I guess you said 1957 when it was kind of looked frowned upon. What, what was well, that like? Like if you were out there, I mean, were there just a few guys nymphing or do you think there were lots of guys that just nobody was talking about it much? No, I don't think there were very many people nymph fishing at all. Oh, almost wow. every, every, almost every angler that I ever saw either fish dry flies or streamers. Yeah. And occasionally I'd see an article in a magazine about something, you know, and, and I'd try to tie those flies and, and a lot of them were very, very successful. So it was it was interesting. I can remember one time when I was about, maybe I was eh, 14. I wasn't driving yet. I know that. Uh, a friend and I were fishing a couple of miles from my house on the, on the Sugar Creek in western Pennsylvania. It was a pretty good-sized trout stream. And a guy came along, and he was all dressed in all of his regalia and had his beautiful cane rod, and he was casting dry flies, and he saw us over there whipping split shot in the river, <laughs> you know, nice. and came Real fly fishermen don't fish with split shot. And then he gave us a, you know, a yeah. discussion of what real fly fishermen did. Of course, we're like the kids that, you know, the fly fisherman that catches nothing and the kids that use bait and catch all the fish. We're the ones that were catching all the fish. So after he left, we just kept right on fishing our split shot. That's great. That's Matter. great. So, <laughs> so that was kind of right around the, um, I guess, 1957, early 60s. And then yeah. Take us take us back to like now you go up to 1979. Is that when the nymph uh, your book came out? Nymphing? Or when, yeah, when that's that? when it came out. Yeah. So in that time, I mean, 20 years, you basically mm-hmm. put this. Well, I mean, I guess the the book. I'm not sure how long it took you to write and everything, but you put together this book, which pretty much was a groundbreaking book. And so in 1979, were people still not nymphing that much, or did your book? Maybe you can take us back to that moment when your book was published. Sure, I'll take you back a little bit before that. 
uh, I got my PhD in 1971 at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And I started teaching on one of the two-year campuses in the Wisconsin system in 71. And in, in 72, there was a um, fly fishing, or there was a fishing fair, not a fly fishing fair, but a fishing fair held at the university that was sponsored by Marathon Waiters, which were made right there in Wausau, Wisconsin. Um, the local TV station, a local radio station, and one of the local sports stores. And I knew the person who managed Marathon Waiters, and he asked me if I would do a fly fishing program. And I said, well, yeah, sure. I mean, I'd never done one, you know. So I put a bunch of slides together, and, and I wanted to show a movie called The Way of the Trout. And so I asked um, this manager if, if he knew anybody that had it. He said, oh, yeah, Jack Sokol, who's the local Fenwick rep, he's got a copy. So I called Jack and asked him if I could borrow this movie. And he asked me what it was for, and I told him why. And he said, oh, yeah, I know about that. So he brought the thing up. And at the end of the time, I showed the movie, and, and then everybody left, and I was rewinding the movie. And Jack came and said, you ever thought about doing anything professional with that? Well, I thought he meant the movie because I was rewinding the movie. <laughs> I said, oh, it's your movie. I don't, oh, he said, no, no, no. I mean the talk you did today. And I said, I don't know, Jack. First time I've ever done it. I just put this together for today to, you know, give Ted Rudolph a, you know, a hand with this program. So, so I said, oh, okay. So he leaves. Never said a thing to me about it. About two weeks later, I get a call from the Fenwick Corporation, which at that time was the leading rod manufacturer in the world. And, uh, and they said, uh, we're going to do these national fly fishing schools. It's the first time anybody will have ever done them. And, and we'd like you to be the Midwest director. And I said, well, I got to think for a second. Sure. <laughs> 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 anyway, so we started doing the, my wife and I both, both fly fish. In fact, she got her first fly tying kit when she was 11. So we, I said, well, sure, we'll do it. So we went and, and uh, got all the stuff that were necessary to do it and started doing fly fishing schools there in, in the Midwest. And then we ended up doing another one down in New Mexico at the, at the uh, Vermejo Ranch down there in addition, every summer. So we were running through these, all doing all these, and, and Fenwick had a, a newspaper that they published that they sent out to subscribers, which was called the Lunker Gazette. And so I started writing nymph fishing articles for the Lunker Gazette. And basically what I did was I wrote all of the major points that were in the book in that gazette. So when it came time to write the book, I had all that information already laid out. It didn't take me long to write the book. I think probably half a year to really write it. And uh, then once it was published, I just I got all kinds of invitations to go and speak. And, and I'd gotten all those anyway because I was the Midwest director of the Fenwick Fly Fishing Schools. So within two years, I knew everybody that was anybody in fly fishing. And uh, it was a very it was a very it was a heady time, very exciting for me because it, you know, you read about all these people, but you don't know who they are. And then all of a sudden you're meeting all of them and talking to all of them. And they, you know, you know, all of them. And hmm. it was very interesting. And, and, and I had a, a, quite a deep background on entomology, not because I'd taken a lot of courses, but because I'd re literally read everything that was available at Penn state and at the university of Wisconsin and Madison and kept extensive notes on aquatic insects and so on. And so the second book I did, which was only two years later, was Naturals, which was a discussion of the trout stream insects and in depth and, and then imitations to imitate them and my experiences with them and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But when Nymphing came out, then a lot of people began thinking about the concept. And then, of course, I did the Nymphing video, which in those days we actually shot it in film and then converted it to video in 1982. And it was actually the first instructional fly fishing video ever made. And uh, it turned out to be really a nice piece of work. I think probably a large part because it was shot in film and because the guy that shot it was also a, a fisherman hmm. and knew extensively, you know, the concepts of nymphing and, and just fishing in general. So he knew how to shoot somebody that was actually fishing instead of just getting shots. He got good fishing shots. So it worked out really well. And then uh, after that, I formed my own company and started producing videos on my own. And eventually we started doing book publishing on our own and so on. Hmm. I see. Okay. So. Wow, so that's a, uh, and, th and that brings us kind of back into the uh, early 80s period. What Going back to those schools, and, and how long did you do those schools, and what do you think, um, you know, what, what did those schools teach? Because you were already a, a teacher, but did those schools teach you anything different than you already knew, or did you learn anything else? Uh, hmm. I don't think I learned anything more about 
the concepts of fishing or nymphing. I did learn a lot about the, the whole concept of trying to teach fly fishing and fly casting. And uh, remember back in those days, nobody taught those kinds of things. There were no schools available, you know, at local fly shops or anything. That all came about because of the Fenwick schools. Hmm. All of this, all of these things that you see developing all came out of that concept of the Fenwick schools. But it was interesting because every year, those of us who were the directors, Mel Krieger directed the West Coast here, uh, Frank Gray did the Rocky Mountains, I did the Midwest, and Jim Guilford did the East. And we would get together every year at the Federation of Fly Fishers back in those days. Now it's called the Fly Fishers International. But the FFF group met every year, and typically they would meet in West Yellowstone, Montana. And so we would all get together then, and Fenwick had a actually had a casting uh school set up just outside of West Yellowstone with ponds and all that sort of thing. And we would all get together and we'd talk about the concept of teaching casting and the words to use and, and, and why certain things work certain way and what the line looks like when it's going through, you know, all sorts of stuff and better ways to do the double haul and just on and on and on. And out of that, you know, that whole discussion evolved a, a very interesting and unique concept, eventually which became the Federation of Fly Fishers a, ma a certification process oh, wow. and that was developed by mel krieger and myself uh, ed rice uh, bruce richards from scientific anglers and a couple of other people we put all that together and and founded that for the federation and of course that's just gone on and 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 the whole concept of teaching fly casting has evolved out of that wow that's uh yeah that's amazing i didn't even realize that yeah you were part of that whole process oh, yeah. yeah so and um yeah i was just thinking a little bit about um because i've been i i'm not certified but i've i've kind of started that process and, and went through it and it's really i didn't know much about it but as you get into it and i and i've had a, a few guests on here that have gone through it and have talked about their experience and mm -hmm. um and it's pretty amazing because i think what it uh teaches people is that um you know, what you learn is that you're not as good of a caster as you thought. You know what I mean? I think before you get into it, I had uh, Pete Humphreys on. I can't remember the episode, but he was talking about he, – um, he's a big steelhead guy. And he was just talking about how he thought he was great and it would be a, a zip to go through the you know the whole thing. And he got in there and he was like, yeah, it's like I'm not that good of a caster. That was the first thing he realized. What – what? Um, I mean, for you, how did you learn to cast and how did you become a good caster? I mean, how did that, all that process work? Well, my first casting looked like the classic beginner cast. I mean, I had no concept because I, I knew no one that fly fished. My, nobody in my family fly fished. And, and I didn't know what to do, and I just would whip it around any old way. But as time went on, I began finding an article here or there in the magazines and, and tried to refine my casting. And then eventually, I, when I got to Penn State, well, even before that, I found a few books that were there that talked a little bit about the concepts of casting and I would work on that. And I think by the time I was, well, by the time I was 16, I was, I could cast well enough to be able to fish with no problem and, and throw under bushes and do all kinds of stuff like that. Just, just because I worked at it so hard. But when I was going to school at Penn state for working on my bachelor's degree in my junior year, I took a 10 week, um, physical ed course on casting not because i wanted to learn how to fly cast because i thought i was already pretty good <laughs> i wasn't but i thought i was <laughs> maybe i wanted to really learn how to bait cast well at the end of the course about no uh, the second week before it ended george harvey who at that time was the uh director of phys ed at at penn state came in and started casting both with a fly rod and with a bait casting rod and he stood in one one side of the gymnasium in the bleachers and cast across to the other side of the bait casting rod and hit the target dead center every single time. <laughs> and then he was doing all kinds of things with the fly rod, and I decided maybe I better really learn how to cast. Hmm. There you go. Yeah, several years later, George and I became good buddies, but uh, at that time I didn't know him, and, and he did do a fly tying course, but I didn't take it because I was already a really good tire, and I'd taken a course the year before from a friend of his uh, at another campus. So... I didn't take his course. I wish I had because I'd have got to know him a little bit earlier than I did. But nonetheless, uh, I realized then that I really needed to work on my casting. So I read everything I could lay my hands on in, in the Penn State Library. And it had a very large selection of fly fishing books because many of the faculty were fly fishers and had written books on fly fishing. 
Hmm. And and as a consequence, they had an extensive library on can, on fishing, and so I read everything I could lay my hands on there, and worked at it. And and nearby was Fisherman's Paradise, which was on Spring Creek, which actually originates a little ways from State College, but flows th- through the edge of State College and then south toward Belfont. And <clears throat> it was a place where we would go and fly fish all the time. And then after Nancy and I got married, and I was working on my master's degree, we lived there, of course, at Penn State. And we would go fishing over there all the time. So it was an excellent place to sort of hone skills, learn about casting, watch people cast, just do that sort of thing. And and by the time I was, you know, got out of Madison with my Ph.D., I was a, a, a good caster. Not as good as I am today because I'm a lot older. But in those days, I, you know, I was a good caster, good enough that when the Fenwick Corporation saw me casting and, and heard me talk about casting, they were willing to hire me to be the director of the Midwest schools. Mm-hmm. And wow. So Penn state, I mean, that, that seems kind of like a crazy coincidence. You get all these fly fishing. Is there a reason why there were so many fly fishing people, or professors and people that were interested in it in that area? Well, I think there's a lot of good fly fishing around there for one thing. Um, Penn state is located in the Nittany Valley between a couple of big mountains and Penn's Creek is there, which is a world-class trout stream. Spring Creek is there, which is a world-class trout stream. And then nearby, there's a whole bunch of other creeks and lakes and other things that are all trout streams. And it's a it's a rural area. It's not close to any big cities or anything. State College is the biggest town around for miles. Hmm. And I think it just attracted people that wanted to do activities in the out of doors. Mm-hmm. And so you get fly fishing. And and in addition, Penn, Pennsylvania had a very rich history in fly fishing. And there were a lot of people there that fly fished and, and still are, of course. And uh, I think that contributed to it also. Just there was a, it was a, a lot of people that fly fished. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the first places. In fact, Fisherman's Paradise on Spring Creek was one of the first catch and release places in the United States. Oh, wow. And – that was just uh, how did, did that? Did you know how that came to be? Was that just a matter of there a lot of people fishing and uh, too much pressure, or, or you know that well, that's become kind of a common place in a lot of areas now around the country? Yeah, in those days, Fisherman's Paradise was when it first started out was a place that the Pennsylvania um, Fish Commission had set up as an experiment. And they were allowed to go there uh, so many times a year. You got a stamp and you could go there. And you were allowed to keep one fish each time you went. And it had to be, a, you know, of a certain size. And it was sort of an experimental thing just to see how things worked. Well, what happened was State College, <clears throat> of course, was growing. And so <clears throat> they started emptying some of their sewage, treated sewage, into Spring Creek. And that caused an abundance of, of plant life. And, and that tended to kill cause some kills because the plant life would use up all the oxygen in the water so as a consequence they they changed it to fly fishing catch and release only and they did that i'm not sure the exact date they did it but fly fishing catch and release only as a national sort of thing basically started in michigan in 1956 when the fish commission there didn't have enough money to do just you know plant and take fishing So they set some of their streams as catch and release so they could ease up on some of their financial requirements. And at first, of course, people were like, catch and release, you got to let these things go, blah, 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 you know. And then all of a sudden, like, wow, we can catch more big fish doing this. This is really pretty good. (laughs) And, of course, Lee Wolf had written that uh, game fish is too important to be caught only once. (laughs) So he had practiced catch and release on his own. And and he was an inspiration in that, too. But but the actual impetus of it in bringing it into the national consciousness – was actually done by Michigan and just as a way to save money. And they didn't have to you know, pay so much for planting fish that people were going to catch gotcha. and take home. Yeah. Gotcha. But it's become, you know, fly, catch and release has become an important component of, of the fly fishing community simply because there's so many people that fly fish and people would prefer to catch larger fish rather than smaller fish. Now, some places catch and release, uh, and this might sound like heresy is not really a very good practice. Because if you're catching every trout you catch is six inches long, guess what? You need to take a few of them out of there. Yeah. You know, a, a, a stream can hold one 1,000-pound fish or a 1,001-pound fish 
or 2,000 half-pound fish, or 4,000 quarter-pound fish, but as a certain biomass, it can contain in nothing else except that. So if you want larger fish, you're going to have fewer of them, but it's going to be more exciting for the angler to catch them. Hmm. So some places, I know streams in Wisconsin when we lived there that, I mean, you could go there in a day, you could catch 100 fish, and every one of them would be, you know, four to six inches long, just little brook trout, mm -hmm. and you never caught anything any bigger. Well, they eventually realized that in some streams they actually put a, a no limit on them just because there were so many small fish that trying to catch anything any larger would just be a waste of time. And you're just, you know, you're not utilizing the resource. So they did that. Uh, and But they've changed their regulations since then. But it was a very good thing that they did at the time. And I, And there are some places, other places where, I mean, you go to Alaska, for example. You can't do catch and release on salmon because they're all going to die anyway. Yeah. So if you're if you're going to kill a few for dinner, if you're going to kill a few to take home, that's fine. But the whole concept anyway of catch and release is a very effective one simply because it promotes the idea that uh, game fish is too important to be caught only one time. Yeah. And it, yeah, and it does allow the fish to get bigger and give us a better opportunity to catch bigger fish. Yeah, that is. And it, I think it also just think it gets people thinking probably that was the early on like conservation, right? I mean, now conservation, I've, I've talked to a number of people on that. Uh, you know, um, Steve Duda, I think comes to mind uh, recently, a recent episode of, you know, uh, the editor of the fly fish journal. And, you know, he noted that pretty much you have to be involved in, you know, conservation and kind of the political stuff these days. If you're, if you're a fly fisherman, just because it's, you know, it's, it's very important. So, I mean, did you see, um, you know, on the conservation, is that something you've seen evolve over the years or what, what has been your take from, from all these years being? Oh, yeah, certainly, certainly, certainly conservation that the idea of conserving what we utilize instead of just everybody's allowed to take 10 fish home and you're going to go there and you're going to stay there until you get your 10 fish regardless. Uh, that's changed dramatically over the years. There's still some people that like to do that and like to kill fish and eat them. And that's fine. I have nothing against mm -hmm. that as long as we make sure that our resource isn't over-harvested. And that's, that's really the, the best thing about conservation. Preservation, as opposed to conservation, is not allowing anybody to utilize anything, which is silliness. Conservation, on the other hand, attempts to utilize the resource to the limit that the resource will allow and not beyond that limit. And that's really what catch and release has done, simply because the number of fish that are being caught by anglers these days is quite high actually our, our yeah. skills have gotten a whole lot better our flies have gotten a lot better our understanding of techniques has gotten a lot better and there's a lot more people that are mm -hmm. fishing so the idea of catch and release really does effectively give us more opportunity to catch bigger fish and enjoy the sport that we love so much yep yeah i uh, i was going to just note that um I'll have some show notes for, you've talked a lot about uh, some links or some people and things like that. I'll try to uh, link out to some of this information you've including your books and things like that at uh, wetflyswing.com slash 45. Um, I'll have all that information there. Um, yeah, I did want to keep going on, uh, you know, a little bit of your, your history and background because you've pretty much been there and been a part of, you know, I mean, a, a lot of the guests I've talked to, I've had some newer guests, and I think a lot of the stuff they've done is built upon what you've done, including like your uh, Euro nymphing and things like that. Um, but I did want to check just a little bit um, before we dig into some of maybe the tips and things and way you've you've caught fish as far as like you mentioned a couple rivers your home river do you have one that you consider kind of a home a home river now that you fish and maybe you can talk about how you might catch uh, those fish on nymphs there uh i really don't have a home river we just moved <laughs> recently to vancouver washington oh really oh wow so, yeah so i haven't set up any uh home river here yet but there are several rivers that i just love the fish and i try to get to every year the madison in, in montana is one of them yep it that's probably my most favorite river worldwide simply because of the the quality of the fish that are there and the conditions there's so many different conditions available to fish there you can fish with streamer flies you can fish with wet flies you can fish with nymphs you can fish with dry flies you can fish small stuff you can fish big stuff and there are fish of all sizes there especially up in the in the uh, catch and release no-kill area from he from hebgen all the way down to about about Varney Bridge, no, not not to Varney, about the Kelly Bridge, somewhere right in there. Anyway, that's a, it's a great stretch of water. It's very classic trout stream kind of water, fast, 
riffles, hmm. rapids, runs, pools, just all kinds of stuff. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. The original Tyrite is a long-standing accessory loved by fly fishermen for decades. It's an accessory you won't live without once you uh, try it. No more drop flies or hook fingers. If you haven't seen this uh, tool yet, it's pretty simple. It looks like a like a pin, a little ballpoint pin with a retractable clip that allows you to hook, basically hook the bend of your uh, your fly in, so you don't have to worry about fumbling with a tiny little fly or hooking your finger. And you just kind of finish the knot like spinning spaghetti on a fork. Just quickly do your twists and you know stick the um, the tip through and you're good to go. All parts are manufactured and assembled in the USA with a 100% lifetime guarantee. And I like to uh, uh, use the example of the uh, tiny little blue winged olive and you know in the winter time. And that's always a good example because you know your feet are, fingers are cold and sometimes it's hard to hold those little guys. Uh, but the tie right makes this easy. You know, using a size 18 BWO, you'd be using the, the tie right junior, and it just makes it a snap. So, uh, just wanted to give a heads up uh, for everyone. This is a great tool from a great company. I'm excited to have them on, and want to uh, uh, get you guys to head over to tyright.com and check it out today. That's t y r i t e dot com. We are also brought to you by Ascent Fly Fishing. Uh, do you struggle at times to tie the right fly on the end of your fly line? What if you had a biologist or entomologist with you next to you telling you exactly what was going on in the stream and what you need to put on? That's basically what Ascent Fly Fishing does with their custom fly box selections. And these guys aren't just a one-trick pony. They cover rivers all over the country, from Oregon over to Colorado, out to New York. Um, you know, they've got basically the entire country. And they're and they're building on from what they've got. And I've got a great example because I have a box for one of my local streams. And it's super awesome and neatly organized. It even comes with a card that shows which rows each of the flies are. You know, breaks down dry flies on one side, uh, nymphs uh, on the other. And talks about different, um, you know, categories of basically the orders of flies, mayflies, caddisflies. It's just really organized, and a lot of flies are on there, which were ones that weren't in my box. So I'm excited to get uh, get on that. And uh, But, yeah, you can head over and uh, pick up a, a local selection from your stream. They have a 100% money-back guarantee as well if you're not satisfied for any reason. So, you know, I think it's time to cut the guesswork out of it. Head over to AscentFlyFishing.com and use the coupon code Wet fly swing to get 10% off your next order. That's uh, ascentflyfishing.com, A S C E N T flyfishing.com. Okay, back to the show. And uh, in the Madison, and I, that is, I've, I've been out in that area. It's, it's, it is amazing. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, if somebody's heading out to the Madison and if they were going to do some nymph fishing, how they might, you know, one struggle I get is people talk about reading water and, you know, I talk to a lot of people that that's a big question they have. And, and then when you're nymph fishing, like staying in the, in the zone where the fish are out, maybe you can provide a, you know, a couple of tips on, on how somebody might, you know, read the water and catch some fish on, on the Madison or how you do it. Sure. Um, there's two zones you can fish in a river, the top and the bottom. Everything else in between is useless. Um, so if you're going to fish the top, basically what you're talking about nymph fishing is you're talking about emerger fishing or nymphs fish just under the film. And in that case, probably the easiest way to do it is to just hang a, a, a nymph under a dry fly or under an indicator only about a foot or so and just fish that zone. Or you may be to take, they may be taking emergers off the top, in which case you see the heads coming out. You can just fish emergers in the film like you'd fish a dry fly. But the real secret to nymph fishing is fishing in the t in what we call the opportunistic periods. That is the periods when there is no hatch going on and the fish obviously are not coming to the surface. They're down on the bottom feeding. You got to get your flies down and you got to keep them down. Now, Euro nymphing came about be <laughs> sort of an interesting story behind Euro nymphing. It actually started out with Polish nymph fishing. And when Glasnost occurred, the Poles wrote and said they would like to be a part of the the international fly fishing tournaments. Now, in this country, we just sort of poo-poo that. But in Europe, it's a really big thing. And if you win that tournament, it's worth a lot of money. Hmm. Endorse, endorsements and, and tackle and, and fame and all sorts of other things. 
So anyway, the Poles said, we'd like to come. They said, well, okay, sure, that's fine. They said, well, we got a problem. We don't have any fly rods because, remember now, they're very poor. They're behind the Iron Curtain. No way to get fly rods and gear and everything. They said, well, what do you have? And they said, we have long spinning rods. And they said, well, okay, you can do that, but you can't use more than 27 feet of line because they didn't want them casting all the way out there with big lures and stuff. And they said, and you got to use flies. They said, okay. And uh, we don't have waders. Well, that's all. You don't have to wait. You can, you can, and, and we don't really have fly boxes. <laughs> Just basically, they basically they came with flies and a cigarette tin, you know. Wow. And, <laughs> and so anyway, so everybody thought, well, you know, what's this going to be? You know, <laughs> so they go in their fly fishing tournament. Now, the guy, now there's five people in the team. So the captain of the Polish team by himself caught more fish than the next three teams combined. Oh, geez. So he caught more than the next 15 people. Oh, my gosh. So he won, he, he won the gold medal for the champion, and then his team, of course, won the gold medal. What year? Do you know what year that was? Oh, gosh, I don't uh, remember what year it was. I, I, can, I have the information someplace, but off the top of my head. I'll, I'll, I'll put a link. I'll find it and put a link in the show but, notes. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, so everybody said, what are they doing? Well, what they were doing was they had these giant flies with about 800 wraps of lead wire on them. And behind it, about 15 inches, they'd put a caddis, a caddis uh, larva imitation or some other small fly. Then they would throw this thing upstream and it would just sit on the bottom, wouldn't drift at all. Then they would just drag it literally with the rod. They would just drag it downstream. So as long as it was on the bottom and moving, if a fish grabbed the little fly, boom, they set the hook instantly. They didn't even have to sit. I mean, they were just moving it and it could hook them instantly. So they, and then, well, of course, you can't cast that kind of stuff on a fly rod. So the Czechs picked up on that concept, started using bead heads and very long, very thin leaders. I mean, they were using, sometimes using tippets that were like 15 or 20 feet long and made down as fine as 7X. Because if you have just a small bead head and you have 7X tippet, there's no drag resistance at all. It can go just sit on the bottom. The line's not going to get dragged back to the surface. Now, remember, the fastest water is at the top and the slow water is at the bottom. So as long as your line is going up through the, the water column from the bottom to the top, it's always in fast water at the top. So as, if it's in fast water, the faster water will always pull the flies to the surface because your line will always go the speed of the fastest current. So keeping it on 7X with a bead on the bottom – anchored the fly against line drag and that's the whole concept that i use with fishing with split shot is to anchor against line drag and typically i don't use check nymphing and other kinds of things because i don't need to i can catch just as many fish as they can catch but in tournament fishing you cannot use split shot and you can't use strike indicators so all you can use you know is the leader that you have well, a lot of them put a piece of red leader in or for something as an indicator just to see when things move. And typically they do what we call high sticking. They just cast upstream, uh, lift the rod as it comes down, hold it up as high as they can through the drift. And if it checks or stops at all, they just give a little pull. And if it's a fish line and if it's just a stone, well, it just comes loose and they keep on going. Uh, it's, a, it's a tiresome way to fish, if you ask me, because you've got to keep your arm held up so high all the time. But it's effective because it keeps the fly on the bottom. And if you're going to fish a, a river like the Madison, most people m fish it incorrectly because they just do not get the flies down on the bottom. Now, the purpose of the indicator is very interesting because, and, I, and I'm the one that really sort of promoted the whole concept of indicator fishing uh, through that uh, video that we did on nymphing. And the whole concept there is that the indicator, yeah, it can indicate that the fish is taking the fly, but the whole, the whole idea is, it tells you the speed that the fly is going because if the indicator is going the same speed as the foam on top, then the fly is going the same speed as the foam on top, which means the fly is not on the bottom. Mm. It's up near the top. If the indicator should be going half to two-thirds the speed of the foam. If the indicator is in the wrong food lane, the fly is in the wrong food lane. Now, typically, when I use shot, I keep the shot, oh, 10 inches or so from the fly. That's really close. And most people say, well, it's too close. No, it's not. It's got to be close. Mm -hmm. It's got to be close because it won't keep the fly on the bottom if it's not close. Second of all, and this is equally important, when the fish picks the fly up, the split shot keeps moving. And therefore, it turns the fly and, and catches it in the skin of the fish's mouth. 
Now, this doesn't mean it sets the hook, but it does it does catch the hook in there, especially with chemically sharpened hooks. It just catches. I mean, and then the fish, and I've watched fish pick up the, you know, in very clean water, stand up on a bridge and watch a guy nymphing below me using these techniques. You can see the fish pick up the fly and shake their head. And, of course, when they shake their head, <laughs> mm -hmm. that just drives it in deeper because they're shaking against a split shot. And then all of a sudden they take off. So when you see what we call a, a take with a strike indicator, it really indicates that there's a fish already on there. Just get the hook in deeper. That's really what it indicates. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you can catch, you can just catch so many fish, you cannot believe it. Hmm. But you got to keep the fly on the bottom. If it's not down there, and if the indicator's not going the right speed, you're not fishing deep enough. And what does your, with your indicator, with your setup, so you've got a, you got a fly on there, 10 inches above that, you got your split shot, and then how long is your leader, and then where, what length, how far is your um, indicator away from your fly typically, or does that depend on depth and things like that? Yeah, a lot of it depends on depth. Classically, people fish nymphs in riffly kind of water, which is anywhere from knee deep to waist deep. So in that kind of water, I will fish the uh, indicator about five to six feet above the fly. And it's got to be that far. I mean, I've seen all kinds of articles where you set it up this way and the fly is directly under the indicator. The fly will never be directly under the indicator in a stream. It cannot be because it's got to be going slower than the indicator because the indicator is on top. The indicator always leads the fly. So as a consequence, you've got to have enough distance between the indicator and the fly so that it can sink to the bottom and, and allow the indicator to be you know, downstream ahead of it. Then the indicator will be going slower than the speed of the of the foam on top, but it's still going to be downstream of the fly because the indicator is going to be constantly being pushed faster and trying to be pushed faster by the top current, which will hold it downstream of the actual position of the fly itself. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. So basically, it, yeah, it depends on depth. So you want to have it maybe, uh, what, a couple of feet or is there kind of a rule of thumb of how much longer you want the leader than the depth of the water or the, the distance from your flight well, to the indicator versus the depth of water? Yeah, typically what I do is I use what I call a compound tippet, which actually consists of two pieces. The first piece is four feet of 1X, OX, 1X, or 2X. And that's heavy because I that's going to get chewed up by the by the rocks and so on that the split shot's bouncing over on the bottom. And at the bottom of that is where you put your knot to tie on your your final tippet to which the fly will be attached, which is the 10-inch piece. Mm. Back in the old days, I just tied a knot there. Now I use tippet rings or leader rings, which were developed in, in Czech nymphing. Mm -hmm. They're actually what we call jumping rings made for jewelry manufacture. And, and they did it in Czech nymphing because you're allowed to use three flies. So they would have two tippet rings on the first tippet ring. They'd have one fly and the second tippet ring. They'd have a third fly, a second fly. Then they'd run a leader off the second tippet ring and put the third fly on. This allows them to change flies very, very quickly because they don't have to retie knots in the whole break down the whole system. They can just untie the lead, the one that's on the tippet ring and put a new one on very, very quickly. Hmm. And time is money when you're, when you're fishing in competition. Yep. The, the more things that they have available to make it easier and quickly do it, uh, the better it is. So I just, I use a tippet ring there because it, number one, it keeps the shot from sliding down on the fly because the shot is above the tippet ring. Number two, as in tournaments, it allows you to change flies very quickly. So you can just, you can change out the fly anytime you need to. You can change out the tip, the final tippet size, that little 10 inch piece on the end, anytime you need to very quickly and very easily rather than having to retie the knot. In addition, it never shortens up the length of the forefoot piece above it. You can imagine tying, you know, changing it and tying it four or five times. All of a sudden, you've got to tip it. That piece, it's only two feet long. But if you have a tippet ring on there, it finalizes the length of that, and you don't ever have to change its length. You just change that little piece that's on the end. And then above that is where I put the, the indicator. So the indicator, is, like I said, is about five feet above the, above the fly itself. Now, if I'm fishing very deep water, like, you might be fishing on the Madison. You know, one time you're fishing in two feet of water, and then three feet downstream from that, you're into six feet of water. What I'll do then is I'll put on several indicators, and I typically will use yarn. I just tie an overhand knot in the leader, stick a piece of yarn through, pull it tight. And uh, as long as you can see the indicator, it doesn't have, even if it's underwater, it doesn't matter. 
as long as you can see it. Well, if I've got three indicators on and I'm fishing in two feet of water, I can watch the bottom indicator. If I'm fishing suddenly in six feet of water, I'll watch a top indicator. So it's it's a very fast and easy way to do things, uh, a very fast and easy way to, to uh, allow you to visually see what's going on at all times. Hmm. That's really the purpose of the indicator. That's why I don't really call them strike indicators. I just call them indicators because they visually allow you to indicate to you actually what's happening, how fast your fly is going, if it's in the right food lane, if something is, is caught onto it, either on the bottom or caught a fish or something. Hmm. Very, very useful technique. Yeah. No, those are, those are awesome tips. Uh, so thinking about that Madison river that, you know, that person may be fishing for the first time there. So they go in there, they get their set up, they've got the indicator and they're kind of thinking about what flies to put on. Do you have any tips on maybe flies to use or maybe top flies that you like using on just for nymph fishing in general, something that can get them into their, get them into a fish there? Well, you know, there are flies that have been used for many years, some of them, maybe even hundreds of years that are all proven fish catchers. One of them is Sawyer's pheasant tail nymph. That tied in a, in a 14 or a 16 will catch fish just about anywhere. Uh, there are other ones on the Madison because there's so many big stone flies. Uh, you can use a stone fly at the top, maybe with uh, tie that on and then a foot or so behind it, put on a pheasant tail. Now you've got a big fly, small fly combination and you can do that. And, and the, the big fly of course is set up so that the split shot is about 10 inches above that. And you just fish it that way. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to use something like a, a, a midge larva, like a, a zebra midge. There are a lot of people that, that don't think that in big water like that, fish take small flies, but they do. They certainly do. I mean, you can catch a lot of fish on a zebra midge, 18 zebra midge on the Madison. It's, a, it's interesting how many of those fish will pick up those small flies. And the reason is there's just a lot of them around. So they're eating them all the time. You can put on a caddis larva limitation, and I'd say a 14 or a 16, and it doesn't have to be anything very complicated. It could just be a basically just a fur dubbed onto the hook, maybe with a with a peacock herald head or something on it. They take that very well on, the, on that river. And flies like uh, the gold ribbed hares here nymph. Um, let me see what other ones I can think of. Oh, um, uh, let's see. Let me think of other ones that <laughs> might be. That might be, you know, sort of standard kind yeah, of nymph. Standard. Would these would these nymphs be? And you mentioned the Sawyer's pe- pheasant tail. Is that just your standard mm-hmm. pheasant tail? And and what and who is yeah. uh, who? Maybe you can uh, Sawyer. Who is that? His name was Frank Sawyer, and he was the river keeper on the River Dove in England. And he developed the Sawyer's pheasant tail as a way to fish very deep for grayling, because grayling are highly prized in Europe, much more so than you know, than in other places there. In fact, there are a lot of people in in England that would rather in, in Europe, I mean, that would rather catch grayling than trout hmm. just because they're such a prized fish. They, they are pretty they, amazing. Oh yeah. And they would stay <laughs> deep. And his original pheasant tail wasn't anything like the one we use. His original pheasant tail was tied on a, a size 12 or 14 hook. And he used wire instead of tying thread. So basically when it was done, it looked like a wire split shot with, with fiber sticking out of it. Hmm. And the reason he did that was because he wanted to sink very, very deep, very, very quick. And he and George Harvey independently developed what we would call the tuck cast. George Harvey's tuck cast was to cast high and check the rod hard so the line would jerk back a little bit and dump on the water and allow the fly, you know, give it a lot of slack in the leader and allow it to sink very quickly. Frank Sawyer's was to stop the rod high so that the line traveled out horizontal to the surface of the water, but high above the surface. And when the nymph came to the end, of course, it would bounce over and flip down and pull the leader after it. He said it would it would check the rod high and allow the line to to snap over, and the lead, the fly would then pull the cast after it. He meant by the cast, he meant the leader. In Europe, they call the leader the cast. Hmm. Would pull the cast after it. So he was doing what we would call an overpowered tuck cast, whereas George's original tuck cast was just to check the line. Later, George also then used the overpowered uh, tuck cast too. Hmm. Okay. And, um, yeah, I wanted to keep digging into some of these tips and things like that as we have time, but I, I did want to talk a little bit about gear because I'm kind of a gear head. I love talking gear and I was just thinking, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned the marathon waders and I, I love all, I cared about the old stuff because, you know, we've got the Gore-Tex waiter. I mean, some of these waders are, are ridiculous, right? $800 or whatever they cost, but, oh, yeah. um, you know, um, Borger's boots, right? 
Oh yeah. That, so maybe I mean I remember I remember those boots. I actually I think I had at least one pair. Can you talk a little bit about how um, you know some of the gear stuff you've had over the years? Maybe how those boots came to be. You could tell that story and then and then why or why not you kind of stayed uh, with gear um, as opposed sure. to just doing your videos and everything else. Well, in in Merrill, Wisconsin, which was about 17 miles north of, of Wausau, Wisconsin, where I was college professor, there was a company called Weinbrenner Shoe Company. And Weinbrenner manufactured mostly shoes for military and police forces and that kind of thing. And they also manufactured steel-toed workman's boots. And it turned out that, that the company was in peril. And so they brought in a man named Jim Greenlee to bring the company back. Now, Weinbrenner was a part of the Bata Shoe Company. Bata is the largest shoe company in the world. It's got, it's got shoe manufacturing all over the world. And the guy that they brought in knew the president of Bata Shoes, and, he was, and Jim was also a guy who did a recovery of businesses that were in, pro, in trouble. So Jim came in, and he started working on that. Well, the university had what they called a town and gown presentations. And so I did a presentation on fly fishing. And after I was done, Jim came up to me. I'd never met him before and said, oh, I'm a fly fisherman. And I work up and I'm the president of Weinburn and all that kind of stuff and, and blah, blah, blah. And, and maybe we should get together sometime and talk a little bit. And so we did. And when I talked, said, you know, I got this idea for waiting shoe. So he said, oh, that's great. So. Anyway, the first thing he wanted to do is he wanted to make them out of leather. And I said, they can't be leather because if they're leather, they dry out. They're harder than a stone. <laughs> you can't use them really well. You have to soak them overnight, etc. So anyway, so he made a few out of, out of leather, and, and uh, they didn't work very well. And, and I said, we need an artificial material that will, you know, like, like nylon. So make the shoe out of nylon. Like a, no, he didn't want to do that. And, and they finally found this material. It was called California Tan. And it was a synthetic leather. And so we made some shoes out of it. And oh, my gosh, they were absolutely perfect. Hmm. And that's how that shoe came about. Hmm. Anyway, and, and so, you know, they started selling it and so on. And, and it's, it's always gotten accolades simply because it was built so well. They just made them. They, they, that company made really good products. Hmm. Well, eventually, Jim had a stroke and he, and he retired from presidency. And, and then he came back a couple years after that and he bought the company. And so everything went on just fine for a few years. And, and then eventually Jim did retire and he sold the company to the employees, none of whom, of course, fly fished. No. And as long as Jim was there, it was his pet project and he kept it going. And as soon as that happened, why, they just said, now we're not making that shoe anymore. Gotcha. Gotcha. That was, that was the end of it. So I see. So they had a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they had a really great product that would have, that could have gone on. But of course, as soon as it dropped out, everybody and their uncle came in to fill a spot. So, oh yeah, yeah, and there's lots of uh, great boots now for sure out oh, there. They really are. Yeah, I, uh, so basically the uh, the gear you you didn't have plans of uh, <laughs> outfitting, you know, having the the waders and boots and the, the whole thing. I mean, actually, I don't even know. Do you have? I mean, your videos, and maybe you just talk about how, as far as you know, over the years where you've kind of made the money, I guess mostly it's been through videos and your books and things like that. And has this been your full-time job for uh, a while? I'm not even sure on the history there. Well, <clears throat> when I was a college professor, of course, doing the teaching and everything was in the summertime. And then I would travel on weekends during the school year to lecture at fly fishing shows oh, and yeah. clubs and do those sorts of things. And I did that the whole time, the whole 28 years I was teaching, I did that. And then after I retired, uh, I, and I still do that. I mean, I, I do all the fly fishing shows, the seven major, seven major shows in the United States and clubs and, uh, and other places, other venues that I, that I go to and speak and so on. And I still write and still do that kind of thing. And I've got a book series that I'm working on, uh, 20 books. I've got the first five out. I've got two more written, but I just haven't had a chance to get them published because we're working on our house trying to get it <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to remodel it and add on to it and do a few things like that to get ourselves finalized out here in Vancouver. Anyway, um, oh, let's see. Where was I going with all this? Oh, yeah. No, I was just thinking, actually, you were, I, I was kind of thinking on another uh, tangent as well. Um, and you, when you mentioned Vancouver, maybe we can hold that thought. But um, 
<laughs> yeah. How did maybe you can just uh, break break over to that, like the um, the the move out to Vancouver, how how that came to be, and I and I would like to. I was thinking about the history, so we we kind of we cut there. I think in the maybe in the eighties sort of thing, but from eighties up until now, making the move to Vancouver, how did all that uh, come to be? Well, I, I retired from the university in 1999, and then we stayed in Wisconsin simply because we had you know, a lot of commitments there with doing other things, and, and eventually those, those left and went away. Meanwhile, our son Jason, who was the, did all the fly casting in the movie River Runs Through It, had moved to Hollywood and worked there for five years, both in front of the camera and behind the camera, but eventually got tired of that lifestyle and moved back to Wisconsin with us found a, a, a girl there and got married and he moved out here and was living out here in this area. And, uh, we didn't really have anything to hold us in Wisconsin. And then we got grandchildren and we decided to move out oh, here. So, yeah. So that we could be close to the grandchildren because I think it's important that yep. if, if grandparents can be close, that they be close, uh, not, not necessarily for the grandparents, although it's nice to have grandchildren, but also for the children, because it's nice for them to have, somebody who is like a parent, but not really a parent, you know, who can spoil them rotten. Yeah, <laughs> you know? that's right. That's right. <laughs> Which their parents won't do. Yeah. Anyway. No, I think that's great. No, that's awesome. That, I think that says a lot about, uh, about you as a person as well, you know, making, uh, making a move, you know, uh, ba- based on family as a big part of, uh, you know, the, the reason that's awesome. So, so you mentioned a river runs through it. So I, I've got to ask a question here. Uh, okay, that's right. um, I mean, you know, it's funny about the river. through. It. I think there's been a whole, obviously we know maybe the young people that are listening to this have never heard of it, but, um, you know, it was the biggest movie back in whatever it was, the nineties that put mm-hmm. fly fishing on the map and, you know, everybody business went crazy and people were selling right. people were getting into it. And it was this great thing. And then it kind of got this thing like, I don't know what it was, like this movie's kind of like, ah, uh, River Runs Through It. But, I mean, I think it was a great movie and um, and enjoyed it. Maybe you could talk a little bit about just your part in that movie and, and, and also your sons just uh, briefly on, on how that all came to be and, and Robert Redford and Brad Pitt and that and everything. Well, in the, in the spring before they actually started shooting, I got a call from John Deach, who was the fly fishing coordinator for the movie and he asked me if i would be willing to come and help him out over the summer and i said i can't i i have fly fishing schools to teach all summer i said maybe you should talk to my son jason he said well we can maybe get him an internship and i said well he's not going to be an intern he's either going to work or he's not going to work he's going to get paid i said he's he's graduating from the university of wisconsin in madison at the top of his class in film and tv production so i said well have him send a resume so we sent his resume in and they called within two days and said we got to interview you and the reason was not because he was graduating at the top of his class, but because he'd been fly fishing since the age of, of five. Well, before that, he caught his first fish by himself at the age of two and a half on a fly. Mm. And and at the age of five, he was teaching in the fly fishing schools. I mean, everybody loved little kids to help him out. Yeah. He would, would help. I mean, he understood. He was a good caster by the age of five. And... uh I mean, after all, he, he had me, but he also had my, and my wife, Nancy, who's a great caster, plus everybody in the industry that knew him. I mean, he had Lefty Cray, and he had Mel Krieger, and he had Fr- Frank Gray, and he had um, Ernie Schwiebert, we knew, and, and wow. all those people. And all of them would help Jason anytime. I mean, he got a little kid, and he's casting, and so, you know, they would help him out. And he, he won all sorts of medals and stuff as a kid, casting and that sort of stuff. So he really understood fly casting. But he'd also been working in my production company since he was 16, both filming and fishing. So he had a really strong background in terms of, of understanding the fishing concept. And that's one of the reasons they, they wanted to look at him. So when he came, they hired him. And, and uh, eventually he did all the doubling for Brad Pitt and Craig Sheffer in the movie. And even some for Tom Skerritt and some of the other guys that were involved in there. And he did a lot of things because he he became a very good friend of the line producer, Patrick Markey. And uh, so he got to do a lot of different things in the movie, which was interesting. In addition to just being in the movie, hmm. he got to do a lot of other things in the in production work. So he got to see how it all worked out. Um, there's lots and lots of funny stories about Jason participating in the movie and, and lots of things that we could spend a whole hour talking about yeah. just that. Sure. But my involvement was really <laughs> – Bringing Jason there, number one. <laughs> number two, 
I worked a little bit with the second unit. Now, the second unit are the ones that do dogs, cars, and trees. That means they're not no actors involved. They're the ones that do the shooting of all the fish jumping and, and all the underwater shots and all the flowers and cars driving down the road and all that kind of stuff. So my involvement was then was talking with the, the director of photography in the second unit about shooting stuff, about fishing, specifically underwater shooting, because they didn't really never done any of that at all and didn't know very much about it. So I gave them some tips and ideas. And, and since Jason had been working with me since he was 16, and now, now this has been, what, four years later, three years later, about four years later, I guess, um, he was more than well equipped in, to be able to talk about techniques to use to make the fish jump and do all sorts of things. And so he did all that. Mm-hmm. You know, basically my involvement was, hi, I'm Gary Borger. Here's the way you shoot underwater. And, uh, and you do this and do this and do this, use this lens and do that. And, and, and basically that was it. Nice. But yeah, but we got to be at the set, you know, and watch a few things going on. And, and gotcha. it's very interesting. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I have, um, I have a, a number of questions here. We're not going to get to all of them. So I think the, the best thing to do is maybe do a little rapid fire here question. Uh, sure. All right. A little section here and see if we can hit up some of these uh, that I have some questions about. And uh, one of them is just thinking about, I guess we, we talked a lot about tips. You really broke down a lot of nymph fishing, you know, kind of some of those, those good tips. Do you have like one tip for just a general fly fishing tip that might help somebody uh, catch a few more fish? Learn how to cast well. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, casting is really the name of the game because the more things you know about casting and the cleaner you can cast, the more efficient you are when you're on river because now you know, okay, here I need to do this cast, here I need to do that cast, and you're not struggling all the time uh, trying to figure out some way to get your fly on the water. It's just instantaneous, and you don't even need to think about it. Yep. Yeah, is there uh as far as fly casting, what what do you think is the best way, uh, I guess, practicing, obviously, but any other um, tips on somebody getting better at that? Well, you know, those the fly-o concept that Joan Wolf came up with and which later was developed by other, more extensively by other people is a good thing because you can use it in uh, any place you want to in the wintertime and so on. But probably the best tip is, Develop your skills with a pantomime method, that is, without using the rod or anything at all. Just run through the arm motions that are necessary to do what's necessary. Because what happens as soon as you put the fly rod in your hand is you revert to to the old ways that you've done it already, which may not be the best ways, and you can get the line out, so that works for you, so you're going to do it. Well, that's maybe not the best best way. Maybe you have to change your arm motions. If, If you're required to change them, then change them without the fly rod because as soon as you put that fly rod in your hand, you're going to want the line to go out. You're not going to worry at all about what your arm's doing. So if the line doesn't go out, you're going to flog around her until you get it going out. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, and I have a kind of a, a little bit of a different question here as far as, you know, looking back when you think of fly fishing in your history and thinking back on your 25-year-old self, is there anything you would have, uh, words of advice you would have given, um, you know, yourself back then that, maybe to do things a little different or just some advice? Uh, let's see. <laughs> Back when I was 25, that's a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. What, what, yes, exactly. <laughs> we went through the history, so we, you're somewhere, and I'm not even sure what year that is. But <laughs> <laughs> The only advice I could give myself at that age is fish more. Really? <laughs> yeah, fishing Fishing in itself is, is, a, is a good thing because it continuously builds your experience, but also – if you do it right, it allows you to observe more things that are going on in the out of doors and more ways of doing things. A lot of people just go out and flog the water and hope that they catch something instead of spending the time really observing and thinking about what's happening and thinking about ways to develop their skills. Yeah. And and that's what I've I've always done that and and, and I did it of course when I was 25. Yep. Uh, and and still do. I still think it's is one of the the things that most people miss out on is really thinking carefully about what it is that needs to be done and trying something new. You know, you go on the last time you went out, you caught a fish and you killed it and took it home. The next time you go out, you use the same fly cast to the same place and hope to catch another fish to kill and take home. <laughs> Just doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. Every time you go out, it's a new experience. Every time you go out, there's new things that have to be done. Every time you go out, there's new observations that you can make that will help you learn more about the skills of fly fishing and how it is that you can approach the fish 
and be a more effective fly fisher. Yeah, yeah. What do you think is, um, as far as like a book magazine or a fly fishing resource other than your own, is there anything, you know, now or over the years that you would recommend for somebody? Well, I think now, you know, there's there's the, the classic popular magazines like Fly Fisherman and, and others that are out there available for the angler. And there's always good material in those to read. And, of course, the, the online resources have just gone insane. Yeah. The problem, with the, the problem with the online resources, as I look at them, is that there are online resources in which people with very little skill are talking about how to do things. And, and basically, you're at, a, at an infant level in terms of your of fly fishing abilities, but wanting to put stuff up, on, up online. See, you've you got to be a little careful of the, when you look online. You know, yep. all the stuff that's out there, there can be so much that's really not valuable at all. Sort of look at the large picture and what it is that needs to be done and how these things might fit in or might not fit into the large picture of fly fishing. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, I did, we, we, we didn't even get into fly tying, which uh, maybe, uh, you know, if we can later on, if, if we have time to get you on again, we'll see. But, um, sure. you know, if it works out for your schedule or whatever. But um, I did have one quick question I from a... I think it was in the Facebook group. Um, it was talking about the red brown nymph. I'm not sure if that's your nymph, huh? but, but he was talking about the bleaching process and some specifics. Oh, yeah. Can you is that is that something you can do in a rapid fire uh, answer? Just about like kind of because he was talking about how <laughs> how awesome what you what you were teaching was. Yeah, well, I, I just used cottontail rabbit guard hairs for the legs, and I bleached them so they're a little bit lighter in color. And you simply bleach them in something like chloroxide which is a bleaching agent for human hair. And it, you can bleach it out very nicely doing that. Um, it's also really not essential to bleach it. I mean, I've tied lots of them because I didn't have the opportunity to you know, spend the time to get the stuff bleached out. I've just tied it with regular old uh, guard hairs from rabbit, from cottontail rabbit, and they work just fine that way too. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. And um, so do you have, out of everything you've done, we talked a little bit about the nymphing and videos, do you have something that you're kind of maybe most proud of or something you think had had the biggest impact over the years? Oh, I think the, the nymphing book and the nymphing video have had the greatest impact in terms of overall influence in the fly fishing community. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. And uh, we talked uh, about gear a little bit there. Do you have a piece of gear? I, I always love hearing, uh, you know, whether fly fishing or not, that's something you kind of your go-to whenever you're, you know, outdoors or something you can't leave home without. Well, I'll tell you my most treasured piece, and that's a rod that Jason developed. Uh, he, Jason was the shadow caster and river runs through it. Oh, yeah. And, and a lot of people don't know he's also a really superb rod designer. And I don't mean just, you know, saying this is good. I mean, designing the mandrels and everything, the layup, the cloth, everything, all the way from the ground up. He's worked with several very critically important manufacturers and, and learned these skills, and he's very good at it. Hmm. He developed a rod he called the SC20, which was the Shadowcaster Series 20 for the 20th anniversary of the movie. And he only made uh, 20 of them. Hmm. And he gave me number one. Hmm. That's my most prized possession that I have in terms of fishing gear. Wow. But but typically when I'm fly fishing for trout and so on, I use a nine foot five weight and, and, and I'm right now I'm using hardy equipment because of their Syntrex process makes fabulous fly rods. They're just so they're light and strong, unbelievably strong. Hmm. And just really great rods. And uh, I use a nine oh five for most of my standard trout fishing, although I've got if I'm fishing small streams, I'll use a lighter rod, maybe, you know, like a an eight foot four weight. Or if I'm fishing for salmon, I might use a nine foot eight weight, or maybe even for for kings a ten foot eight, a nine foot ten weight, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. But graphite's such a critically important material in rod construction anymore, yeah, because it produces rods that are lighter in weight, and so you can feel the line off the tip when you're casting. Yep, yep. yep. Did you, um, you? You've done some steelhead fishing over the years, I guess, right? Oh, a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. Lot, lots of it. Did you ever get into the whole uh, spay casting thing? Uh, I can spay cast, but I never, I never did a lot of it because in the Midwest where we were, we didn't need spay rods to be able to fish the rivers there. All right. I mean, a river, a river there that's eighty feet wide would be a big river, and I can easily cast across an eighty foot river. That's no problem yeah. with a single rod. 
gotcha. Yeah. And, and then you guys were casting, yeah, if you had to cast a sinking line or, or big flies, you, you could still handle that with an eight weight. Oh, yeah. yeah. Easily. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So I think we are about there. I did. So uh, you mentioned Jason a couple of times. Is there a uh, place um, if somebody wanted to connect with him or is he still doing some stuff? I'm not even sure in the fly fishing out there in the industry. Has he, has he got some stuff going still? Uh, Jason still does talks and he does a few magazine pieces occasionally and other things. Uh, you know, he's <laughs> he's a young father working his his rear end off to try to keep his family going and all that kind of stuff. Yep. So he doesn't. You know, when I was teaching at the university, I could get off on weekends and, and fly places, but I had to be back Monday morning, you know, for class and so on. But Jason, because of the, of the situation that they're living in right now, his wife's a registered nurse. She works weekends. He works all week. Sure. So they're they're really busy as a, as a young family. Yep. But he still does go places and do things. Yeah. Yes, he certainly does. And and you can get a hold of him on just his blog, which is his name, jasonborger.com. Oh, perfect. Yep. Okay. Yeah, people can go there and... Uh... Yeah. Checking with them and, and follow yeah. up with some uh, River Runs Through It questions if That's they want. Right. <laughs> no, I, I, lo- I, I love, I, I've mentioned this before. I know a lot of people that listen to this are, are, are just fishermen and fi- fly fishers and they're not in the industry. But I love uh, hearing about hearing about it because it sounds like, you know, a lot of the things people do on fly fishing do it on the side. You know, they kind of have a normal job and then they do it on the side. What do you think is the biggest uh, reason for that, that, that people aren't able? Is it just, it's just such a small niche? It's just not big enough to kind of, uh, I mean, I guess people have gone all in. I've, I've interviewed Skip Morris where he, you know, I think wrote a lot of books that supported, but uh, what, what do you, what's your take on it? Well, I always tell people if they're interested in getting a career in fly fishing, don't quit your day job. Yep. Simply because fly fishing itself as an industry, as a small industry, uh, the, the gear fishing or bait fishing or whatever you call it is 70 times larger than fly fishing. Hmm. Fly fishing is about a billion dollar industry in the United States. Gear fishing is about a 70 billion. So you can imagine with a billion dollar industry, there's not a lot of money available in terms of supporting a full lifestyle for somebody unless you actually work in a company that's manufacturing fly fishing equipment and or distributing equipment. Right. So for writing and speaking and that sort of thing, it, the money just isn't there in terms of being able to support a family. Now, in terms of being able to support your sport and doing something that you really love, that's great. Yeah. But but as far as I'm concerned, you know, being a college professor and doing that, and when I was a college professor, I had a nine-month contract. I wouldn't sign a 12-month contract because I wanted my summers available so that I could do teach fly fishing schools so that Jason and, and Nancy and I could travel around all over the place fishing and just enjoying life and enjoying the out of doors. And, and we did. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Gary, I think we're, we're about there. I just want to check before I let you go, if you, in the next six to 12 months, uh, you know, is there anything new you have going on we can look out for you to expect? Uh, maybe the release of another book or two. Uh, potentially some new stuff on casting in, in terms of DVDs. I I did one casting DVD, which is called The Perfect Cast One, and I still have two more I want to try to shoot. And just depending on how much how fast I can get the siding on this house, <laughs> mm. I might be able to do one this fall. Otherwise, I'll have to shoot them in the spring. But, yeah, I still have stuff going, and I'm still working on stuff as fast as I possibly can. Okay. All Perfect. right. Perfect. And if people want to find you, they can just go to uh, GaryBorger.com? That's right. Perfect. All right, Gary. Well, I appreciate you. We went a little bit over, I think, our hour allotted time, but I appreciate you answering questions. And it was, uh, you know, hearing the history from you and knowing how big of an impact you've had on fly fishing. I, uh, I appreciate you coming on and sharing uh, some wisdom. And I hope uh, hope to see more of uh, and look forward to your book. Your big uh, finishing up. You, you said you've got uh, quite a bit more to, to publish out here. Oh, yeah. So yep. we'll keep an eye out for that. So, uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. All right. My great pleasure, Dave. Thank right. you for inviting me. OK, see ya. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 45. And uh, please head over to iTunes and click the subscribe button. This is the fastest way that I know of how uh, we can help uh, find new people and maybe get some more people into fish. You can go to wetflyswing.com slash subscribe to um, get the details on, on doing this. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. 
For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. 